one after another, uh, the majority of the founding fathers, there were no mothers then, uh, was the head of a department at Stanford. This was caused by the fact that we were a community here. Unlike most universities, the people did not run home from their uh, uh, classes, uh, but stayed around the university most of the day. The, the med school was around here, very close, and we knew and in general liked each other. Many other schools have tried to imitate human biology and have been unsuccessful because they had to find it difficult to get large numbers of persons who could be friendly. That friendliness made a big difference. And the status of the people who started it made a big difference. Josh Lederberg had won the Nobel Prize in genetics and was head of genetics. Uh, Dave Hamburg was head of psychiatry. Uh, Al Hasdorf was head of uh, psychology. I was head of sociology. Uh, Don Kennedy was head of biology. Uh, as, and also from biology came uh, Paul Ehrlich, and I hope I haven't left anybody out. And uh, coming the next, first year when we started to teach was Colin Pittendrick, who was the dean of the graduate school at Princeton, and who was reputed to be a wonderful teacher and was simply spectacular. We just loved having him with us. So we got started because of an atmosphere at Stanford in which we were all somewhat unhappy with the state of the university, the state of the students, the feeling of disjointedness, if you will. Lots of the students didn't like the curriculum the way it was. They wanted change. They wanted something more dramatic. Or There were probably uh, more uh, opinions than there were students, but there, you had a general sense of malaise. And the faculty were not too happy with the way things were either. They felt there was plenty of opportunity to change. And as a result, uh, we started to negotiate. Uh, when we did, we thought we were going to have about 50 students a year come to this program of human biology. We had no basis for that judgment. That was just what we thought. As we began to plan it, and rumors of its future existence began to spread, we realized we were going to have many more students. And the result was that we were frightened that we were going to be too much of a competitor for the departments at the university. Stanford is a, was at that time completely departments with some occasional uh, research institutes, but they were always the afterthought and the center of the university was the departments. And we decided we'd have a program in human biology that we would appoint nobody in our department, as a de novo at least. They would all be in other departments. We wouldn't give anybody tenure. That way we would not have any commitment to any particular person or party or group, uh, and that we'd have freedom to improve our teaching, improve our teaching, improve our teaching for the undergraduates. And by so doing, uh, we felt we would have the problem of increased enrollment. If it got too big, too successful, the money would not come because the university would cut us off because we were making the department so unhappy by being their competitors. We were all pretty experienced at this departmental world, and so uh, we uh, decided that we needed a, an endowment, that we would not just run on the money, perhaps from the Ford Foundation, that they would give us to go for, say, five years. They did, in fact, offer us uh, a little over a million dollars, and I was one of the two people, you know who I left out? Norm Kretschmer, the head of pediatrics, was another of the founders. Norm and I, and I'm glad I remembered him because he was a good friend, uh, Norm and I were given the task of dealing with the Ford Foundation representatives, and it was my task to make the decision and announce it. And uh, the two of us met with the two of them, and they offered us a little over a million dollars, and I said, no chance at all that we'll accept you've got to give us an endowment in addition to that. They said it's against the policy of the Ford Foundation to do that. We said if we don't get an endowment, when the five years is up, we'll collapse. We're not going to do all this work in order to collapse, so we'll say no to your money. And we left. And as we left, Norm, who was a big-time researcher in bigger grants that I ever participated in, put his arm around me and said, Sandy, you're in the big leagues now. So we waited 
And in fact, what happened was they gave us $2.6 million. $1.6 million was for an endowment, which would pay for half the salary of four full professors. And uh, we raised the matching money, and we had some funds that would be, go along, and the university paid for all the staff and backed us in every conceivable way right along. Plenty of people got discontented. Uh, for example, biology found it infuriating that a higher proportion of human bio students were accepted by medical schools than of biology undergraduate students, but there's nothing they could do about it. We had enough money <laughs> to keep going. And there's been a continual fights ever since, but nevertheless, that's how we started. And we started to be a program for the students. I'll never forget when we decided not to ever have any graduate students at any level. What happened was that many students who were graduating in the early years said, we want to have some program where you can take an MA at least in human biology to continue these interesting things we've done. And our uh, response to them was, absolutely not. This was fostered by Josh Letterberg. Letterberg said, if ever we get any graduate students here, I know you guys will all start playing to those graduate students. We want to have a complete and sole commitment to the undergraduates. And in that way, we can survive and keep true to that faith. And that's what we did, and it's lasted right along. I started reporting on three experiments in social psychology. They were all in, on a related topic. As I finished the first two and started the third, I suddenly realized I had done the whole damn thing wrong. The images that people have are markedly affecting uh, the way they perceive, and sometimes to the detriment of truth. I once gave a lecture uh, here at Stanford to a big class where I got completely confused. I was about halfway through the lecture when I realized that one of the main points I was making was just absolutely backwards. It was just wrong. And the reason it was clear to me it was wrong was that the later things I said could not be true if the first thing was correct. So I stopped the class and I said to the students, stop, cross out everything you started to say from this point on, everything you wrote in your notes, and I'll explain to you how I know I got it wrong. Mea culpa, and I'm sorry, and you, now do you see why that I must have been wrong, it couldn't be true, and so on. At the end of the class, two students came up to me and said, Sandy, that was great teaching. We never heard anybody do a better job of explaining the importance of theory in experimental research. We were just accepting what you were saying without thinking about it. I said, no, 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 I made a big mistake. Ah, oh, don't give us that, Sandy. <laughs> so I asked the class the next time. I asked the class the next time. And they all said, no, no. We know you wouldn't be so stupid. You are too impressed by the tuition you have paid. You can't stand the idea that your teacher could be that dumb. But I was that, that dumb. So many human bio students say nice things to me, and I haven't got the slightest idea who they are. Because they were in the hundreds, and each year, and thousands over the years, human bio students are everywhere. Uh, Barbara and I went to uh, uh, visit New, New Zealand, and in the Oakland Museum, as we went up the steps, there were some human bio students coming toward us saying, Sandy, what are you doing here? And we, we met them all around the world, which makes it very hard for faculty in the, in the program to have an affair. Anyway, I, I meet uh, students all the time. One of the things is, so many of them are doctors. When I go to the Palo Alto Clinic, I would say about one out of four or five doctors <laughs> that, that take care of me or my sweetheart uh, were said, oh yes, I had you in human bio. Well, there's one, <laughs> there's one guy who's, it's funny, I will report. Uh, he's had a checkered career. Uh, anyway, uh, he's been an assistant secretary of the Treasury and also an assistant secretary of the Defense Department, and he's now the head of the uh, $30 billion pension benefit, U.S. Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. And he comes about every year or two to report to Barbara and me about his latest failure or triumph. 
and he always claims that whatever he does came from the principles he learned in my courses. And I've decided that I never said exactly what he said, but it's perhaps related. And on this basis, he's a guy who figures out what the right thing to do is and gives me credit. <laughs> so, so I accept. I had that experience with a story that I told in Human Biome that, that's very funny. I, I was talking about crowd behavior and how, why crowds are not like individuals acting and how the sense of power, of the multiplication of bodies and people and emotions and the contagion operate to have people do things they would never do on their own. They really, uh, people who do horrible things in a crowd can be the sweetest folks on earth in the family or uh, in the classroom or wherever. And so I told a fictional story to demonstrate the power of the anonymity of the crowd. And I said, imagine that there's a student in, in the class who, well, there was lots of students in the class and it's the uh, uh, end of the term and it's time to hand in the blue books, the time is up. So I always come to get the blue books because the, the TAs, they, they can't get people to hand them in. My more authoritative voice, they're more willing to hand them in and people are handing them in and I notice this one guy just keeps on writing and writing and I said, look, you gotta hand these in. If you don't hand it in soon, you, I'm not going to accept your paper. And he just kept right on writing. So I was angry, and we put the, in the story, I put the papers in the box, and I start to walk out, and he comes running up to me. And I, I said, I'm sorry, it's too late, I won't accept it. And he says, do you know who I am? I said, no, I don't give a damn who you are. Good, he said, and shoves his paper into the middle of the pile. I thought that was a charming tale to illustrate anonymity and the power that it gives. And within five years, a student sent me a copy of a New Jersey newspaper which reported this event at Stanford. Can I tell you something? Yes. I've been told that story. I, I was thinking you were copying somebody. No. If you made that up, yes. millions of people have heard that joke. <laughs> That's funny. Human bio will continue to survive because it has a structure that is dynamic and constantly changing in a good way by looking at the feedback from the students and from the faculty and trying to create a better match between what the students need and the environment in which they perform. And that's going to change the nature of it, but without changing the, the underlying structure. And it will continue to be an undergraduate emphasis. And nobody is against the uh, general purposes, if you will, uh, that human bio has. And I think that it's done a wonderful job of helping students as individuals to understand the complexity of the world and the diverse ways in which one can study it. These different perspectives give different answers, and yet usually those answers are complementary. And so I think it's, it's just going to continue to thrive. And one reason it will continue to thrive is having succeeded for so long, it has a public, an audience, a group that cares about it and will continue to support it because they know how much it meant in their lives. That's very different from the beginning when all we had was, what can we get out of the Ford Foundation? It's just a, a thrill to think about the tremendous waves of uh, distribution of uh, ideas and thoughts that the, this particular pebble has put into the stream.